My name is Kelly Yarbrough, and I'm the Director of Community Programming at Prairie Wood Retreat and Preserve in Manhattan, Kansas. Normally, I'd be busy coordinating our public event series, like yoga, open trail days, and artist receptions. But it's a weird time. In-person public programming is out. But I can't help noticing that some things haven't changed. The earth is still spinning and spring is upon us. We still need sunshine and fresh air. We need connection to each other and to places that matter. The Places Between Us is part podcast, part walking tour. Conversations from a distance with artists, poets, educators, and change makers as they take us on virtual walks through their own special places. Hi, Terry and Sue. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm really excited to be able to offer this edible wild plants class with you and with UFM, even though our circumstances this year have changed a bit. Well, you know, by doing it this way, we can show a lot more because walking, you know, you may only stumble into 12 or so thing, you know, and you're just like, well, there's, I can't believe we can't find so-and-so out here. So you, you've pretty well got the top 25 on that one there. Yeah, that's a good point, Sue. Thank you. Um, to start off here, I would just like to ask you two to introduce yourselves and tell us how you got started with Edible Wild Plants. Uh, Terry, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I think I got interested in, in, in wild plants as a virtue of who I was born to because my parents were both, both kind of nature nuts. Some of my earliest memories were of going to a fish hatchery and harvesting watercress for watercress bread and butter sandwiches. And my mother would harvest uh, lamb's quarters when they were tender in the spring and prepare them like spinach. Um, and I was blessed with a marvelous career through my apprenticeship with my parents as they had Caw Valley greenhouses. I had my own retail uh, garden center and fruit markets, uh, east side and west side markets for 43 years. And a particular interest of mine was herbs. And I was always cooking with herbs and so forth. Uh, in retirement now, I'm a, uh, training to be a docent at Kanza Prairie. So I've been learning all about natives and it's kind of re-sparked my interest in uh, edible natives and about to drive my husband crazy with a new entree every day that's a, a wild foraged vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Terry. Sue, how about you? Uh, I just did some calculation, and I think it has to be now about 45 years ago. Um, I directed UFM uh, for about 17 years, and so I was always looking for classes to offer, so I took my own personal interest. So I got Ewell Gibbons' book and Adele Robinson and kind of just sat out in the field one day and said, well, they must be edible around me because I'm probably the opposite of Terry. If anything, my parents probably sprayed everything that was what you might have called edible in our yard. So I had um, no, we ate canned peas and canned corn. So that was kind of my life. So, And just for people who might not know, Sue, can you explain what UFM is? Sure. Um, UFM, uh, we called it at that point a free university that people with skills uh, could teach. They didn't necessarily have to have a PhD. They had to have a strong interest and in self-taught or book learned. Um, and that's still going on now. It's 50 plus years. That, uh, it was supposed to have been inclusive that all people could come to the university. Right. Got it. Thank you. And then you do have a, a long-standing connection with K-State as well, right? Oh, yep. I can uh, top Terry's 43 years at the market. I think I made 49 at K-State. So, I'd like to ask you, in general, what are some best practice guidelines for anyone who might be interested in doing their own foragings and anything specific to this area of Kansas, too? Well, I'll start with that. I There are so many wild edibles. Um, you can get books upon books and get yourself overwhelmed. I would recommend you pick 25 of the top that I hope we can more concentrate on during this class and get to know those and get to know the stages of when they're edible and when they're uh, bitter and you wouldn't want to touch them or maybe that's the stage when their roots are good or... You know, so 
I would concentrate on a smaller amount and just know those really well and then branch out over the years. Good advice. Mm -hmm. Carrie, what about you? Um, my interest in edibles is good taste. And like Sue, uh, and, and being a, a fruit marketer all of my life, when you pick something is extremely important. That watercress that's wonderful on a sandwich in the very earliest part of the season is hotter than heck later on when it's in flower. That's not when you eat it. Same lamb's quarters are wonderful when they're young and tender. Not so great when they get over the hill. The other thing I would add, there are certain look-alikes things that really look similar, like hemlock. And you need to know a few of the don't go near plants. I mean, they won't hurt you if you touch them, but well, at least hemlock won't, but you would not want to mistake it for a, a, a parsnip or a carrot or something that also is ferny. Yeah, that's very important. Good advice. Um, what about location? Where are places to maybe look and where are places that you should avoid or be, be wary of? I can start with that. Uh, certainly you want to respect the uh, wildlife uh, uh, or prairie preserves like Kanza Prairie. You should look and not touch there. So if you have permission to collect on private property, um, and in town, some of these weeds are just in your alley and accessible uh, weeds that taste great. So uh, don't harvest in areas that are protected. Be sure you have the permission of a landowner if you go out to harvest uh, in the, on private property. A big one to add to Terry's comment is um, the potential that they've had herbicides applied. Um, you know, the highway could have gone by and sprayed that ditch. I might um, mention something about uh, eating natives is uh, my intent is not to make uh, natives a large part of my diet. I'm just an experimenting with what they are and uh, tasting them. If, if all of the human race were eating natives, there'd be no natives left. <laughs> and so I kind of like to dabble in it and try some things, but I'm not making it a part of my diet because I don't want to deplete the, nat uh, the natural landscape. Terry and Sue, could y'all share a little bit about some of your favorite native edible plants that you found around here and maybe how you like to prepare them? Well, I'll start, and I think um, anything that you would do with spinach, you just kind of broaden your ideas out. If you make a spinach quiche, if you make enchiladas that have some spinach uh, filling, anything that you would do with cooking and adding spinach to a recipe, you can take the lamb's quarter, you can take the, the stinging nettle when it's in its first uh, 12 inches or so, and it's probably 10 to 12 of those different pot herbs you could use. So think about spinach. Uh, I don't want to eat a bowl of nettle, um, even though one can boil it up and put butter and salt on it. It's probably good, but I haven't yet brought that into my longings to do, but I know that I can take many of these and... Um, put them into a quiche or something like that. So that's my first starting point. Terry, you are more experimenting. Well, I, I got some really good nettles out there along the trail to uh, that goes from Rocky Ford to uh, Willow Pond uh, camping area. And uh, once I, I cooked them first so that I wouldn't be subjected to the sting because the sting goes away the minute they hit the hot water. So once they were cooked and not very long, I took them out and I did remove the stems, add the butter, salt and pepper. And at that early stage, they were really pleasing right around the time you cued me to them. And then of course I saved the water for tea because nettles are so nutritious. Um, the other thing I loved as a green was the curry dock. I'll tell you that stuff, I, I removed the long tough rib and just cook the greens. And again, very briefly drained it, butter, salt, and pepper. I think you can gather from this, I like butter, salt, and pepper, but <laughs> it was really good. It was just like a, a young tender spinach with a splash of lemon. 
saved the what was left because I had quite a bit and made just an omelet the next morning with it. Just absolutely wonderful green. Wow, very good. That sounds tasty. <laughs> Um, kind of in the same vein, but are there any uh, wild edibles that you know about that you have not tried yet, but you would like to? Well, I always laugh when I read, you know, the very first most abundant edible is acorns. But the mm. process to get the value out of them that our uh, Native American folks did, I mean, you're like boiling them three times and pouring the water off and and then roasting and grinding, you know, it's like, okay, I can just go to the store and get flour, but you know, it would be fun if I really wanted to spend a good part of the day. Right. So maybe we can do an acorn flour retreat over <laughs> the course of several days. <laughs> I, ha I have one that I really want to try uh, based on reading up on Lewis and Clark. Uh, in their travels, they appreciated so much the uh, Native Americans use of what they called Indian turnip, which is scurf pea, and uh, it's kind of a tumbleweed. It's in the legume family, and it has a turnip-like uh, root that the Native Americans would braid by the roots and preserve them that way dried. Uh, they used them fresh uh, without cooking as a crispy vegetable. They uh, cut them up in stews. They dried them, powdered them, used them like flour. And Lewis and Clark were very fond of these on their trip across the country. And so I, I am dying to try those. Um, I do want to mention the timing here, too, because we're recording this right now at the end of May. And of course, the the video is going to come out with the class in early June, but um, because of the way we had to do the class this year, we were actually able to get some some footage of these different plants in different stages kind of throughout time. But in general, what's the best time for folks to look for some of these wild edibles? Sue, you have more experience than I. Well, I would start, you know, mid-March through now, you're going to get minute that starts in those 85 degree days, things just bolt and grow fast. But, you know, again, it depends on what part. Um, what resources would you recommend, either book or online, uh, that people might look at? Sue, you just recommended four books to me, and well, I just ordered a couple of them. <laughs> yeah, there was there is one on there, and he has three books. It's by Thayer. Yes. And every site I went to, because I honestly didn't just trust my judgment, it was probably the top book that came up. But yeah. it's in three volumes, and the only problem with it, you he'll only do about 30 plants per book. Um, so it becomes an expensive purchase by the time you would add all three. Um, there was a second one that was... There was John Callis. Yeah, he came up everywhere. Um, and then Kelly Kinger, sorry, we yeah. have to give Kelly a plug. Um, Kelly's book, Kelly walked across Kansas right. and ate his way across Kansas with edible plants. So... Kelly's book should always be included in your list. Terry, you yeah. have another one that this, I see often. This one is just the one that was recommended to us as docents. Uh, Wildflowers and Grasses of Kansas, Michael Haddock. And I, I already had a copy of it in my possession. And it's a, it's a good uh, listing of plant, the, the uh, natives by color of flower, which is oftentimes will narrow it down quite a bit for people when they're trying to figure out what they're seeing. Great. And I will, I am familiar with that book too, and that it actually has a website component, kswildflower.org. Um, and it does list in the description of those plants um, if they have any edible properties. And a plug for Mike. Mike Haddock is a uh, local um, K State Associate Dean Librarian. Uh, so his experience is in our area. Mm -hmm. the, the other secret that we should mention, and that's the one I learned from Terry, is the app that you can put on your phone. And Terry, tell them about the app. There, there are a number of uh, apps available. Um, 
I really like the the only one I've worked with, which is Picture This. Um, I recently went on a plant walk in Overland Park uh, with a naturalist who experiments with home medicine too, and she uses Seek, one by National Geographic that also identifies animals. Um, and I think. In, most of them have a free tryout period too, but I've been amazed at just this picture. This woman will identify plants in their skeleton state when it's winter. If you just take a picture of the dead plant, it'll get it. It does grasses, it does domestic plants, it does native plants, either from the foliage or from the flower. So I've, it'll at least point you in the right direction. It's maybe not 100%, but these are just going to keep getting better as people add their experience to them. Great. That's wonderful to know. Anything else either of you would like to talk about kind of in general before we start looking at some specific plants? Um, we we touched on usage as greens, and uh, that's probably my favorite way to use edibles. Uh, another um, it, it, in the summertime is when, or early summer um, to to late summer, there are some fruits that are uh, naturally edible, and just eat them right where you sit. One thing, one other thing, well, two other things. I love to make tea. And there's a number of things that lend themselves well to tea. Uh, and one other thing, um, edible flowers from violas and dandelions in the spring. Uh, there, uh, there's plenty of edible flowers to use too, just as garnish or fun. And our daughters so enjoyed eating wild oxalis in the backyard. The wood sorrel that's yellow tastes like pickles. And I think they practically overconsumed them in the yard. <laughs> Overgrazing, huh? <laughs> yeah, they were grazing. <laughs> so what I'd like to do next is I'm calling a plant ID challenge. I, I used the short videos and photos that, that you sent me and kind of put them together in a random order. Um, and I want to see how fast you can jump in and name that plant. I took a video, so this is totally stacked in my favor. I won't. Uh, I, I won't keep score. Don't worry. We're we're playing okay. together. It's a collaborative game. A nice patch of stinging nettle. <laughs> and Sue cued me into how sh how she used it. This the stinger is the important part to there. You got a good picture of the stinger in between the joints is a little um, stinger. If you, when you look at the plant and that's the part that uh, really hurts. They say you can rub dock onto it to get the stinging out, but that's never worked for me. So you actually pick that with scissors and gloves. And long and sleeves and then bring it home and put it immediately into the boiling water. They always, half the time, don't tell my guests, but I'll make a mix of spinach and nettle and have us, I call it the stinging nettle quiche. And after they've told me how good it is and can they have the recipe, then I'll say, oh, well, it was stinging nettle. And they all kind of gulp and, oh. Uh, <laughs> and don't forget to save the drain water because that's your nettle tea. We have some garlic mustard at its optimum time for picking here. And I was uh, new to garlic mustard this year, positive in my identification though, because it, it's really easy to recognize it. So it is an invasive plant. Uh, I didn't harvest mine on Kansa Prairie since you shouldn't, but I did uh, get some uh, out of a public park that this stuff is not wanted because it puts toxins to other plants in the ground, much as black walnut trees do. So it inhibits the growth of other plants. And um, so I took the, some of this from Tuttle Creek and simply stripped the leaves off and made pesto with it uh, and served it to my kids on some Dylan's brand uh, frozen cheese pasta, and we loved it. This is really a tasty little plant. Uh, friends of mine have used it in soups and stews. Love it. Mm -hmm. 
And that white blooming plant, Sue, is tiny and creekside, good old watercress, past its prime. I, I always see beautiful watercress at the edges of Kings Creek on Consta, which is such pure water. And I'm so tempted to pick some, but you shouldn't. But if you find a nice, clear, cold running stream early in the spring is when you'll find beautiful watercress. And is watercress best uh, just kind of used as a green like some of these others? Yes, absolutely. Just on a butter sandwich, just watercress. That's brings back, I, I'm two years old again with my mommy. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like something you would have gotten in uh, Macy's tea room or, or something. You know? <laughs> oh yes, with the with the crust taken off. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you're getting to plantain. You got plantain it. Plantain is. You'll often find it in your yard on really, oh, the worst ever part of the soil where you've walked a whole lot and you haven't cultivated and put anything else in. It's usually something I, before I realized that it was really good, I was trying to dig out of the yard. Oh. And at the stage you see right there, that's a perfect time to get those young leaves. Um, Terry, you go ahead and talk about eating. Yes. Um, well, I, I was too late this year because I grabbed some today when I was out collecting some uh, cattails and I boiled them up uh, and I blew them for a good amount of time. And they were so tough. Really, I have missed the opportunity this year. So next year, I'll try earlier. Uh, but I found something extremely useful for this plant. M on my walk that I did with the medicine woman over in Overland Park, she said, chew some up and put it on your wound if you've been bee stung or uh, have some malady. So I managed to get poison ivy on my ankle. And I prepared a poultice with this plant, just blending up some leaves and put it on some gauze and slapped it on. And I haven't itched since. I'm so happy. So wow. I, I, I think I found my poison ivy remedy. This was my attempt at tea. Yes, New Jersey tea. And um, I tried the fresh leaves that I, um, I not only steeped, I boiled them to be sure I had enough heat to get the flavor out, but it was pretty nondescript. A friend of mine uh, who was also a consadocent not too long ago um, said that I should try drying the leaves first. And it's, it's like a caffeine-free tea once you finish. And she said it tastes much better once you have either fermented it and dried it or just dried it. It's nice that it na its name kind of suggests what it can be used for. <laughs> Who's brave enough to try waving this <laughs> thistle? Uh, supposedly, you can eat this as a green suet. You haven't tried it, have you? No, too pricky. <laughs> yeah, they said remove the spines, but my lord, you'd be doing that all day long. So I'll leave that for the cattle. I'll, I'll, that's on my list of things to try. I'll bet Mike will be all in for that one. There you go. That's my long-suffering husband. Oh, I love this. Wild parsley. It's so good. Never knew it existed. Did you, Sue? Was that um, on your list? Of only things? by the books. I hadn't had it till you started. Oh, my goodness. That's a good one. Um, so it, just from, my mom was kind of an ex exploring type of a cook and you know, you, you taste something and it can inspire you to make something with it. And that was the case with this. I tasted it. I thought, oh, that should go in salad dressing. Cause it's kind of tough to chew all by itself. So if you blend it, say with Greek yogurt and some mayonnaise and a little bit of garlic salt and, and olive oil, it's salad dressing, even picky Mike. He, liked, he loved it on salad, uh, a great salad dressing made with this. Then I tried it in another salad. I had a, a carrot slaw and uh, frozen peas salad, mainly because I was out of lettuce and I needed a salad. So shredded carrots and peas. And I used a dressing, the kind my mom would have made back in the 60s, Miracle Whip and a little bit of milk and uh, vinegar. But I, I put a bunch of chopped uh, wild parsley and oh I loved it it was really good and it got better as it sat for a day roses are pink in this case well what I would wait for is the rose hip 
Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about T, um, and boy, you can get some big hips in some of those wild plants. And I always have a jar of rose hips. Um, you know, again, um, it's not the sweetest tea. It's going to have a. You might have to add sugar, but um, good. Any kind of remedy you might want for colds, it's going to be on the top of herbal uh, remedies. Well, they should start showing up in August, September, and um, the, um, they are so much safer to get out on the prairie than domestic rose hips because most roses you grow in your yard, you have to spray with all kinds of things to keep the bugs and or disease off. So harvesting wild ones is much safer proposition. Um, and then, it, you know, if you're doing something fun in June that you want to garnish with rose petals, the petals are certainly edible and not very flavorful, just kind of bland, but they're pretty. Just be sure that you give them a good rinse because they're very attractive to tiny beetles and, and little bugs. Be sure there's nothing hiding inside. Mm. Cactus has been burned here uh, from the spring burn, but the the fruits are sweet and the leaves are, are panicles. Um, you can uh, scrape the the uh, spines off and use as a vegetable. I haven't done that. Have you, Sue? I've eaten the fruit, but not the not the uh, leaf. I've had it fixed for me, and certainly uh -huh. in some exotic supermarkets you can buy. Uh -huh. um, and work on it yourself without going out to the prairie, but uh, certainly um, people in New Mexico and, and more the Southwest would be harvesting that and getting that those prickles off and the, getting down to the good part inside that uh, big leaf. Yeah, and the fruits, though seedy and stony, are delicious. They're um, red and uh, have uh, a very sweet, uh, stringy consistency, but you kind of chew on them and spit out the seeds. That I almost thought for a minute we had a lead plant, but it is ground plum. Go ahead, Sue. Well, I taught a class last year and I don't know if Kelly, if you were along for the walk, but all of a sudden somebody reached down and started nibbling on this and uh, it was new to me. I don't know why I've stepped over it all these years, but a uh, pretty uh, a big kind of a plum growing down tighter in there. And there's a picture and uh, just nibble right there and then. Nothing you have to do beyond that. I'm sure you could take it home and make jam or jelly out of it. But To me, it had a pea or bean flavor. I would be tempted to uh, chop them up and use them as a vegetable, maybe in a stir fry or something. Um, but they do, they have a pleasant taste. This is an example of when you would not be eating sumac, <laughs> but when the red uh, panicles show up, uh, later this summer. I am anxious to try the tea uh, with a fresh one. The ones up at that Roger Schultz Park were still red that I tried and really, Sue, it reminded me exactly of rosehip tea. A nice, uh, you know, lemony taste and so I'm anxious to try it fresh. Although some friends of mine that have said it, it becomes very thick with the fresh ones. Have you experienced that? I, I think my tastes have improved, but back when I was younger and tried it, I thought it was a cup of sugar per cup of tea, but uh, I'm sure, <laughs> I mean, I had them really fresh. And then I used to actually uh, jar them up and then save them, so. I've heard people make sumac lemonade too. Is that, is that Same like thing. Cold, it's, yeah, uh, or you, I cool, like cold I cool yeah. our tea down and make, call it lemonade. Got yeah. it. Did I get that right? It's, I think you did. It's it's a very tiny one because it was early in the year when I did this. It seemed like it was an unusual place for it. I always think of these as, you know, a little bit under a shadier fence like. This just seemed to be out dry and barren. I was surprised. Uh, I think it was I think it was where I know they are though. It's it might be on the outskirts of where they're more 
abundant, but I think it, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And we all know what to do with raspberries. <laughs> Something I didn't realize you could do, but I learned recently is you can actually use the leaves for tea on that plant too. I haven't done it yet, but I heard that. So this is my favorite, um, not having anyone give me flowers for Mother's Day. We were out biking and uh, I took this photo. I just think it's a, a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. This is one of the best I, I've seen. Um, it's mullen. Um, the two things that always stick in my mind are uh, the Indians, according to the lore, would uh, put it in their moccasins. It's, it's it very... Um, um, soft. I'm sure it would dry out after a while, so I'm not sure how long that lasts, but thought of Dr. Scholl's and, and putting a little bit in to protect your blisters. It's also talked about as uh, something that they rolled and smoked. The second year is a totally different plant, so when one gets to know a mullen, one will see the second year in a tall spike that can be at least six feet tall with a dark brown cluster of um, kind of seed shells at the top. So it's a two-stage plant, um, which is uh, not a common thing for most of our plants. But I don't know that I'd eat it. It's terribly fuzzy. You know, Terry's braver. Let her try it. Um, no. But it's, huh. just, uh, it's just so beautiful, and uh, it's one of my favorite finds always when I'm out hiking. Well, if there's anyone in this class that fails to recognize this, then they are um, truly a beginner. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is everywhere. Um, and you can, I, I, there's hardly a part of the dandelion plant that you can't use. You know, you hear people talk about dandelion wine, uh, the young shoots, the roots for coffee, um, the flowers. I, I don't know that there's a piece, obviously, you know, now they're bitter, and uh, but uh, that's probably when you'd start looking at the roots for some of those bigger plants. But uh, dandelions everywhere, not that tasty, yeah. but uh, I, probably yeah, Terry's I, butter and salt and pepper, they probably no, didn't. <laughs> it, it didn't pass the butter, salt, and pepper test with me. The greens were less palatable than other choices. Now, for fun, if you had some kids around, everybody likes anything that's deep fat fried. So either these dandelion flowers, or I understand you can also do it with red clover that's in season right now, a light fritter batter and deep fat fried. And then you have your choice of doing cinnamon sugar, which the kids will love, or you can do salt and pepper and uh, use them as a savory uh, little hors d'oeuvre. Our daughter's favorite forage plant in the backyard, wood sorrel, is like pickles and very tasty, uh, very uh, citric. Uh, so they're an uh, antioxidant. This is another one when you're out walking to surprise your friends and bend down and, and uh, take a nibble and then pass it. You know, they're always going to give you a funny look, but once they bite into it, it's got that sour... Uh, taste that's just, you know, I'm not going to eat a whole plant like your kids did, Terry, but uh, yeah. uh, a, a nibble is just so much fun when you're out hiking and it's yeah. just about everywhere. This is a trick. It's also a wood squirrel. People don't talk about eating the, the violet wood sorrel and I haven't tried it. You always hear about the yellow but not the violet. And wood sorrel is also called oxalis, right? Yeah, it's oxalis, same as shamrocks. Yeah. That is the sticky little cleavers, yeah. And oh my gosh, that tasted awful when I tried it. So I'm not going to tell people to eat that. Those but, but it's so much fun. I mean, it yeah. is, you go deep into the book, it'll tell you maybe some ways to use it edibly, but it, it's just so much fun. Mar, I have an almost five-year-old and a two-year-old, and 
they just it's easy to identify and then you just throw it at somebody and it sticks to their shirt and the little kids giggle and um, and you make your crown so you can look like carol baskin yeah <laughs> they're great I mean, you can make a little floral crown with them it's in the gallium family and the galleons are the little white flower that we use in horticulturally it's said to be the plant used for Mexican vanilla, but um, and it, the, the tame gallium has a really beautiful vanilla fragrance. Those I definitely want to try in some stir fry or something. Have you, Sue? Well, that's another one that I'll pick as I walk along with the little sword. Yeah. And again, it's another one to just, you know, get get people enthused about wild edibles because it's almost every trail is going to have a little wild onion and yeah. you don't feel bad about picking a, a you know one little uh, strand of the green and, and yeah. chewing and do you use the green part like green onions or are there bulbs in the ground you can use it all all of it yeah Well, this is what Terry took home and ate. Um, yeah. This is the dock. This was my alley walk behind uh, Marlatt and Goodnow. Um, so I would trust, um, you know, it was just obviously between an apartment and an alley, no one was tending it. But docks everywhere. If you're a, a farm person taking this class, you'll just shake your head because you just want to get rid of it. Uh, but Terry ate the, the leaves, even at this stage, but... And, and that was my opinion of it. I thought it was just the worst old weed, and oh my gosh, it's delicious. I'm gonna, ha now I'm looking at a beautiful plant. It used to be so ugly to me. Delicious. Is this one that you can, you can eat the leaves pretty late, like when they're at this stage, or are they better early on? Cooked, you can. It tasted, they were a little rough in texture for raw. I'm sure at a younger stage, you could use them as a salad green, but I just held, I folded it together and pulled off the, the center spine and then cooked it. And oh my gosh, it's great. I was trying to capture here, and unfortunately, this was one that got chopped down but I wanted to show the, the juniper berry <clears throat> as you hike and on juniper trees. You put them in your, you can take one and put them in your mouth. They're not terribly, they're, they're an interesting taste just to, to see what they're like. And a lot of wild game and meat recipes have sauces to use with sage and juniper, and juniper and perhaps a fruit. Like maybe you might do pineapple, juniper berry and and sage together on a pork or on a, onto some wild game. That's our <laughs> lamb's quarter. Yep. And um, what you see on there is a very typical part of it that's very silvery, almost feeling dusty there in the center. And you turn the leaf over and it's silver. And I, if I'm looking from a distance and I just see kind of a bluish green foliage compared to the surrounding foliage. Mm -hmm. Tried it, didn't like it. <laughs> Wild salsify. It's got a carrot-like root. I tried it raw, unpleasant flavor. Tried to cook it. It actually, in the microwave, this is funny, it became crispy with water. I, it was just, it was not pleasant. I, I, I'll have to try again. Sue, any good experience with wild salsify? No, but it's one that people, you know, can easily identify. And yeah. with next stage, it's going to have something that looks like a gigantic dandelion bl yeah. bloom uh, yeah. with the fuzzy balls. But uh, yeah. it's, in, it's in almost all the edible plant books as being edible. Yeah. Well, we oh, it <laughs> seems like whenever you're out walking, somebody just doesn't know and they're about to step off the path. And I'm, I'm trying to always teach poison ivy when I'm out walking with anyone. You really need to learn to identify it. Yeah. And there's a misconception that, that there is also poison oak and poison sumac around. They don't grow in Kansas. So poison ivy are the three leaves that you need to worry about in Kansas. 
Sue, you you have honors here. Well, this is the one I just introduced Terry to, and as she said, be careful because this is something the butterflies. I wouldn't go out and get everybody in town to go out and forage this, but that at that stage, uh, you could cook it up, saute it just like a like you might do fresh peas. Um, it's it's just tender and tasty, uh, but it's boy, there's only a little window of when. Uh, one can harvest it because it's going to suddenly get those big yeah. pods. And Even younger, without any of the purple showing us, the way I picked it, we went on a family trip down to Fall River and had a cabin, and there were six adults there, and I picked a bunch of these right along the road that were just little marbles. Nothing was open. You can see that some of these are open. All of them were closed. Took them back, removed all the leaves, but cooked them in their clusters just for a minute. Drained them. Again, my standard, butter, salt, and pepper. And we, everybody just devoured them. They, everybody loved them. And this does have a couple of different names, antelope horn, spider milkweed too, right? Mm -hmm, correct. So it is in the milkweed family. And it kind of sprawls on the ground instead of one straight up like the common milkweed. Well, here was our trip to see what stage cattails were in. Uh, this is out at State Lake 2. If you go into a small inlet, you can wonderful little paddle with frogs croaking and the uh, red-winged blackbirds singing their hearts out, probably yeah. May, May 19 or so. Yeah. This is about the stage that the ones on the Canyon Trail at Tuttle Creek are right now, and they have absolutely beautiful fresh water flowing through them, so I felt very safe in harvesting them today. And I just, uh, they pull up, if they come up with the roots, you can uh, save the roots, and I'm trying to precipitate some starch out of the roots that I've read about, but the you know, simply by uh, cutting about a six inch section off the bottom from the roots up, and it's white down there, and then taking the outer layers off until you have about a pencil thickness left, six inches long. Those are what I boiled for a, a couple of minutes, drained, then sauteed butter, salt, and pepper. And as I said, they were like a wonderful noodle. They were just delicious. That was lunch today. <laughs> Yummy. I think this is our last one, actually. Thank you both so much for your time and, and work on this. And I think having your personal insight is just wonderful. Thanks, All right. Molly. Thanks, Terry. Yep. See Bye. ya. Bye bye. Actually, it's something funky. I just tried. Th thanks this for doing this. This is a grape leaf. You hear the crunch? Yeah. And it's, it's not bad. <laughs> Wait, did you do anything about it?